Amen. So we've been in a series called Irresistible, and this week is, is our third installment of that series. We're talking about Jesus today, but, but the, the, the series that we've been working around here, it's been a few weeks of it, but we're talking about the idea behind an irresistible church, an irresistible Jesus, an irresistible love. And the first week, which isn't part of that list, was that you are the most irresistible thing to God. But I wanted to do this series with us because we've been grown. We've got a lot more people that are coming to the church. And I want to make sure that everyone knows what it is that we are and who we are and why we are and why we do the things that we do and all of those things. But us, but on top of that, there's this great messaging here. This idea that an irresistible church, I mean, the world would love to tell you how the church is not irresistible, but instead how it, how it hurts people and how it's bad and how, it's, how it leaves scars and it leaves people with bad memories. An irresistible Jesus, people would love to tell you how Jesus is condemning and doesn't uh, have grace and why does he let you suffer? An irresistible love, I mean, we're all searching for love in so many different ways. And the world would love for you to just not feel loved. And so the, the, this has been great messaging because we've been able to take these three things and kind of turn them around and, and put them in a way that's like, wow, that is irresistible. And it's irresistible because I'm irresistible to God. And so it's brought some kind of special meaning to these things. And so before we move on, I want to recap a little bit with the definition of what it means to be irresistible. Irresistible. Impossible to refuse, oppose, or avoid because it's too strong, pleasant, attractive, or strong. I want you to, uh, I think half the room will probably agree with this, but I'm going to read this definition again, but I want you to think about, in one hand, an open jar of peanut butter, and in the other hand, a spoon with a big glob of that peanut butter on there. Is peanut butter irresistible to anybody in here? Yeah, a few people. I know it is to, to my wife. So if you, if you think about it that way, I've got peanut butter, I've got a jar, or I don't know if it's Nutella, or I don't know what it is for you, but it's impossible to refuse, oppose, or avoid because it's too pleasant, attractive, or strong. So that's kind of the, the definition that we've been going with throughout this series. And the greatest truth that we have for that is the truth that you are irresistible to God. So a, a lot of what we talk about is, is us approaching God and what we do with God and for God and how we become closer to God. But there's also this truth, this idea that, listen, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, see, God made Adam and Eve, made man. And then when they sinned, he threw them out of the garden. He had to remove them from the garden. But when he did, he protected them. And then he gave them a sacrificial way that they could still have a relationship with him. And then he sent Moses, and Moses freed the Israelites. And, and he talked to Abraham, and Abraham had all those kids and helped create all the Israelites. And then there were all the kings that, that God put in place. And, and you talk about King David. And then finally, you know, God sends Jesus, and Jesus comes. And the whole reason that all that happens, if you look at your Bible, and you pick up a, the, the... Actually, I have one here. If you pick up your, your physical Bible, from, from, one, from one cover to the other cover, this entire book is about God's pursuit of you. Why would God pursue you if you weren't irresistible to Him? He made you. He loves you. This whole thing is a pursuit of you. That, that's the, the central truth behind this entire thing. You are irresistible to God. But because we're talking about Jesus, I don't want to make any assumptions. So let, let's, let's talk about this Jesus guy. So I would assume that if you're here in church this morning, that you have some understanding of who Jesus is. I don't think anyone in here has been uh, tricked enough into thinking, wait a minute, I thought this was a movie that we were going to, and instead this guy's preaching. I think everybody understands that we're here. As a church, we believe in Jesus. And as a church, we believe in, in the kind of the miracles and the truths and what the Bible says about Jesus. But there's a lot up for debate there. You may not fully believe in Jesus, or you may not fully believe in all the miracles or the truths. But, but regardless of which, I think this is an environment where it's fair to say that, okay, we believe or we would say that Jesus is the Son of God. And that Jesus, and if, if this is your first time in church, this is kind of the real basics of it here. Jesus is the Son of God. God sent Jesus to earth. Jesus died, he gave us the Holy Spirit, he went up into heaven, he died for our sins so that we can have a relationship with God. So that's sort of, I would say that's the, our, our common ground, where we can say we can all meet in that place. 
And, that, and that's the very sort of Bible answer, the very kind of Christian version of that is that. But, but as I thought about this message, I thought about, yeah, but like what's, what's actually, that doesn't always help me. How, how do I feel about Jesus? Or what is it that I think other people really feel about Jesus? And I thought about the Jesus that you don't feel. See, the, the, the Jesus that you don't feel, this is the Jesus that doesn't answer your prayer. This is the Jesus that doesn't heal you when you ask for a miracle. This is the Jesus that seems to ignore you when you pray or when you ask him you know, to, to relieve a hurt or a pain or something that you have. This is the Jesus that, that's reduced down to prayer hands on a phone. This is the Jesus that has become an emoji. The, the, the Jesus that we don't feel is the one that oftentimes leaves us feeling like, is there even a Jesus or a God that listens to me? Or is there a Jesus that, that I can be a part of or he can be a part of me because I keep asking him. I want my kids to follow this Jesus guy. I want Jesus to interact in my kids' lives, but I'm watching my kids go a completely different pathway. Where are you, Jesus? See, in church on a Sunday morning, it's easy to say, oh, I feel the presence of Jesus. You know, you sing a song, especially with, with the band like we have up here, and they're leading you guys, and it's like, man, I can really feel Jesus in the room, and this is great, this is amazing. But on a Monday morning, or when the kids are at school, or when you get sick, or your mom gets sick, or when everything just seems to be falling to pieces, it becomes the Jesus that you don't feel. So it's like, where is this Jesus? Where is this Jesus at? See, my, my hope for us and today is that I, I hope and believe that I can change your mind on some of that. And, and what I want is the, the Jesus that, that you can feel. See, I hope that, that you'll believe a few simple truths about Jesus. I hope that, that, that at, the, at the end of this message, you'll be able to actually claim and say, okay, you know what? Now I understand a little bit more about him. And I, I do feel more about him. See, I, I hope that you will believe that Jesus is irresistible and that Jesus is this all-loving Heavenly Father. And I hope that you believe that he is worth more than just prayer hands on a chat group or, or worth you know, uh, you know, thoughts and prayers, you know, kind, of, kind regards, thoughts and prayers, hope your mom gets better. You know, that's the way we all communicate with each other. But he's more than that. And I hope that you'll be able to see that he's more than that. I hope you'll see that he's actually life-changing and, and that, that he, is, he is this irresistible Jesus. Remember, irresistible is something that you just can't do without because it's just too good. Think You just can't put the, the peanut butter jar away because you just want one more scoop, one more scoop. So when we think about irresistible Jesus here, we think, okay, here in the context of this church, this is what drives me personally, is that Jesus is irresistible and it shapes everything that we do here. See, what you guys don't understand is that everything, or maybe some of you understand because you've been around us long enough, everything from the parking lot where Mr. Bruce is all the way in here to the message and then after the message and your way out the door is set up and designed so that you can get a glimpse of an irresistible Jesus. Everything we do here is designed for this purpose. See, the, everything in the world wants to try and convince you that, that, that there is no truth for you to hold on to. E everything in the world wants to convince you that there's no truth for you to hold on to. And you know that because you feel that. There's things that you want to claim for your life of, of I'm not a victim to anxiety or depression forever. I can break free from, from the history of my family. I don't have to adopt the abuse and the alcoholism that my parents brought and my grandparents brought and my great-grandparents brought. I can be completely free of addiction. I can be completely free of, of the strongholds that are shaping my life. You know, we, we want to be able to claim that, but everything in the world is shaped and designed to pull you away from that to tell you that you can't do that, or you can't be that. Or it's going to give you three easy steps, you know, to, to, to do that, and th those are hollow, and they're full of hollow things. And so instead, we shape everything that we do here so that you see Jesus as an irresistible thing, because I can't control what happens to you at work on a Tuesday, but we have some influence over what happens to you here in the building on a Sunday. 
So if you ever wonder, why does Chris do this, or why does he do that, and why does, are things happening the way that they are, this is why. Because I want you to encounter an irresistible Jesus. Now, when I thought about this message more and more and more, I thought, okay. So, if I'm in your seat, and, and when I write these sermons, I have to think to myself, I've got to sell this to myself first. Like, if it doesn't make sense to me, or if I don't believe it, or if it doesn't impact me, then there's no way that I'm going to communicate it to you guys. Okay? I consider myself maybe the dumbest in the room. And then, <laughs> thanks, Gail. No. <laughs> I love Gail. Yeah. On Thursday night at Life and Community, Gail sat over there and it threw everything off for me. I was like, Gail's supposed to be on this side. She's not supposed to be on... No. No. So I like to consider myself just... You know, hey, I, I don't have to be smart. God's not tricky. We don't have to be smart to understand Jesus. And so when I think, okay, if Jesus is irresistible, if we're going to sit here and say Jesus is irresistible, what, what makes him irresistible? What is it that, that, would, can, that would persuade me to believe that Jesus is is irresistible. How would I be able to take something uh, to somebody that doesn't have this, this foundational relationship in Jesus and say, okay, here's, here's what makes Jesus irresistible, and them to say, okay, I can understand that. I can wrap my head around that. I can begin to accept that. Because I don't want to assume that anyone in here, just because I stand up here and say, hey, Jesus is irresistible, and God loves you, and you're irresistible to God, and now everything, you take that out, and you just say that a million times over in your head, and everything's going to be fine this week. I, I want to give you more than that. So, so I came up with, with these three things, these kind of three criteria that I feel like makes Jesus irresistible, and it's this. Jesus was irresistible for his hope offered, his credibility, and his access. So now I've also I've made it even more clear. Karina, you can go to the next slide. Hope, credibility, and access. These are the three things that make Jesus irresistible. So l- let me show you. I'm going to spend the most time this morning on, on hope. I could actually spend, the more I dug into this, I thought I could do a, a sermon on each one of these because there's so much to it. But let's talk about hope, for example. The definition of, of hope is, is this. The confident expectation of what God has promised and its strength is in his faithfulness. So that's, the, that's the Bible version. When they talk about hope in the Bible and Scripture, that's the definition that they're talking about there. This confident expectation of what God has promised and its strength is therefore in God's faithfulness. Well, I can tell you this. A lot of times when I've had hope, I've had zero expectation of what God has promised and zero strength in belief in His faithfulness. This is the definition of hope, but this is a really hard definition of hope to grab onto when your life is just falling to pieces all around you. But then when you look at hope as, as, as defined just in Webster's Dictionary, a feeling or desire for a particular thing to happen... Okay, that I can start to kind of wrap my head around a little bit. It's this feeling or desire for a particular thing to happen. See, so we see this definition operates in our house all the time when, when one of the kids wants something. You know, when Benjamin's got his mind on, how am I going to manipulate this scenario because I want to go to the shops because if I go to the shops with mom, then I get to get a new toy and I get to bring a toy home. And so he starts to hope for this feeling, this desire that he's going to go to the shops with mom. And then that just depends on, okay, what does he need to do to get mom to go to the shops? That's a hope. A lot of you are there relationally. You're there with each other because one of you really, really hoped that the other one would accept you or let you go on a date with them. A lot of Children have happened because of this hope, this feeling, and this, there you guys are. Okay, you're listening. Because of this feeling and this desire here. But, but hope, hope, that's what hope is. And see, hope is this incredibly important thing. Maybe it's the most important and most powerful emotion known to man. We, we, we could argue and say that no, love is. Love makes the world go around. And that, that's true. That is true. Lo- love is, is huge. But l- let me explain how powerful and important hope is. I've got a, this really cool study that was done that just talks about this. There's a guy in 1957, and it's a doctor, Dr. Kurt Richter. And he did a study, and if you know the answer to this, keep it to yourselves. Don't spoil anything on me here. In 1957, 
he started to work with, with rats. And what he would do with rats is there were wild rats, and then there were domesticated rats. And so he would take the two, and he would put them in a, a beaker or a jar of water. Now, a wild rat that was put into a beaker of water, a jar of water, it would tread water or swim for about 15 minutes before it would get exhausted and it would drown. And what they would do then is put the, the, the domesticated rat in water, and the domesticated rat would sit there and, and tread water or swim for not 15 minutes, not 60 minutes, but 60 hours. And so he said, okay, what is the difference between the two? And so then what he started doing is he, he started taking the wild rat, and he started putting it in for 15 minutes, letting it get to a point where it would start to drown, picking it out, drying it off, giving it a break, putting it back in the water, letting it tread water. And then when it got ready to drown, to pull it out, dry it off, and then immediately put it back in, just after a couple minutes of break. And he started to realize that the rats would tread water longer and longer and longer. And after doing that a couple times, the wild rat would then tread water or swim the same 60 hours as the domesticated rat. See, what he discovered was happening is that the wild rat was not used to being put in a confined space. It didn't know what it was. It didn't understand it. And it didn't know that there was an end to it. And so after 15 minutes of, of kind of hopelessness, it would give up and stop swimming. So what he found is, is this study actually became a study on hope. That, that when, when these rats realized that there would come a time that they would be plucked and saved out of the water, they would swim and tread water for 60 hours. See, that, that, that's, that's just how powerful hope is. It impacts rats. It's that powerful. You know, we, we use rats to study cancer and everything else. Why not use it to study hope? And so here we have this study... That, that turns out to be proving the fact that, that when something has hope to hold on to, that, that it can save their lives, it can prolong their lives, as the most dangerous thing that we're up against is hopelessness. See, that there's a, a, a book uh, called A Case for Christ, and there's a quote in there that I really like, and I want to read it for you. It says, Difficult times are by definition difficult, but they're nothing compared to the weight of hopelessness. See, hopelessness is something that, that you can walk into a difficult situation and you can throw money at it, you can try and fix it, you can throw a relationship at it. There's all kinds of things that you can do. But when you feel the weight of hopelessness, there's no treading water in that. There's no rescue from that. That is just one of the heaviest things that we as people or even animals can carry. So before I move on, I just want to pause, and I want you to pause, and I want you to think to yourself, is there somebody in your life that could be feeling, feeling the weight of hopelessness? Or is this you? Do you right now feel the weight of hopelessness? Or is there a feeling in your family? Is there someone in your family, your friend circle that maybe feels this way? And if you feel this way, don't feel guilty. Definitely don't feel guilty. I, I've been here many times, several times, in this place where it just feels so heavy that it's hard to even get out of bed. Difficult times are difficult, just by definition. That's fine. Give me difficult all day long. But to take away somebody's hope, that's what will end up drowning them. Now, just like the scientists did with the rats, there's something that we can do for, for people. I want you to think about the heaviness of hopelessness, the heaviness of how it even impacts animals. And think about, think about the, the weight that that is. Now, if you take the opposite of that, how then can we help that? Well, we can take that weight off of people. And by doing that, it's through giving the gift of hope. So when, when we give the gift of hope to someone who needs it, it may be one of the most valuable gifts to ever give. And see, you don't know what exactly it is to give this gift of hope. We, we had a, a lady that was here uh, years ago. And she'd come on a, on a Sunday morning. She'd come a couple times. And one Sunday morning, she was sitting having coffee. And um, 
Someone else, I think, was around her or about to be around her, but I just walked up to her, and I was on guest services at the time. I wasn't up here, but I just saw her sitting in there, and I just thought, I'm going to you know, buy you a coffee. So I went and said, hey, what would you like? And it was cappuccino, and cool, great. Here it is. Got it from Camisa, put it down in front of her, walked off, you know, done. Bob's your uncle. And then a couple years later, she came up to me and said, that Sunday morning, I came to church, and after church, I was going to take my life but you brought me a cup of coffee. And that, that gave her a gift of hope. Did I do anything special at all? No, nothing. But what happens is that we underestimate how little it takes of Jesus to give this gift of hope to somebody. We, we, it's, it's so tiny. It just takes a little bit, and it lifts all that weight off of somebody and gives them that opportunity. And see, it's because that, I think that's what makes Jesus so irresistible. Because of Jesus, then we don't have to have this hopelessness in our world. See, he, he takes all that away. Because of Jesus, we don't have to live a hopeless life. Because of Jesus, no rats have to drown. Because of Jesus, we can continue to give the gift of hope over and over and over again, whether it's through something as simple as a cappuccino or through prayer or through whatever it is. We can continue to give that hope and uplift people. Now, I want to share a couple verses with you here. These two verses that I have, these are what I call like the feel-good verses. These are the things that were on cards that hung on my mom's uh, rearview mirror growing up. These would be printed there. And so Psalm 62, 5 through 6 says, For God alone my soul waits in silence and quietly submits to Him, for my hope is from Him. He, he only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress and my defense. I will not be shaken or discouraged. This is a great prayer, Psalm 62, 5 through 6, to write down, put on a card, and pull out anytime you need a little bit of motivation about hope. You pull this out and you say that He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress and my defense. I will not be shaken or discouraged. No one or nothing is going to take hope away from me. I go to another verse here in Isaiah, and this is one a lot of us know. But those who wait for the Lord, who expect or look for and hope in Him, they will gain new strength and renew their power. They will lift up their wings and rise up close to God like eagles, rising towards the sun, they will run and not become weary. They will walk and they will not grow tired. See, that's another one of those great verses that we could speak over our lives and say, wow, look how great Jesus is, how great God is. I can put my hope in Him and I can soar like an eagle. You know, eagles can soar. They can also just, you know, get shot out of the sky as well. And some of us, we feel like we're trying to put our, our eagle, we're, we're, we're trying to put on our wings we're trying to soar like an eagle towards the sun. We're trying to say that we put our hope in God, but it's really, really hard to do. So I've got a couple stories that we're going to go through of people that were in desperate environments. And they had this guy named Jesus walk through their town. And when they heard that he was coming through town, they took a stab at hope. And it's that stab that they took at hope that changed the trajectory of their life. So the first one is that there was a lady who hoped enough to grab a cloak. Now many of you know this story, but for those of you that don't, I'll explain it to you. Jesus is known at this point in time in his ministry as a guy that's doing miracles. He's doing miracles everywhere. And, and people know that if they come to Jesus, that maybe a miracle of healing can happen. And Jesus is walking through, and there's a huge crowd around Jesus. And people are bumping up against each other, and they're trying to get to him. And there's a woman, this sweet, sweet woman, has been born, and she suffered. I don't, I don't actually tell you that, but I don't know if she was born with it, but she suffered from from a, a disease or a medical condition that's just caused her hemorrhaging and a lot of bleeding, which people would consider her unclean. They would consider her kind of to be an outcast in society. So this was impacting everything in her. Now, for me, that's not a, that's, I would not in that moment be a courageous person. I would be conditioned to kind of sit on the outsides. I'd be conditioned to kind of be a victim. I would be conditioned to say, well, this is just what I was born with. This is who I am. This is my lot in life, and I can't change it, and nothing will change it. But that, it's not her. Because as Jesus is coming through town, 
Look at what she does. This lady, this amazing lady, and a woman who had suffered from a hemorrhage for 12 years and had spent all her money on physicians, and she couldn't be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his outer robe, and immediately her bleeding stopped. What caused this woman to move from the outside fringes to come pursue Jesus just to touch his cloak? What was it? It was hope. I have hope. Hope is that if I bring what I have to him, what he gives me back is going to be healed, different, and better. And this woman took an incredible amount of courage and she came up and she touched his cloak and she was healed. And this wasn't just in her mind. Everyone knew what had happened. So we can move on here. And Jesus said, who touched me? Jesus felt it. And so while they were all denying it, you know, everyone said, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. You know, I didn't do it. It's like in our house, you know, who left the door open? I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Well, I guess it's the ghost that lives here that just walks around and opens the doors. So they're all saying, we deny it. And Peter, he, he, who's with him, he says, Master, you know, I mean, come on here. The people are crowding and pushing against you. There's a ton of people touching you. And in 46, Jesus said, but someone did touch me because I was aware of the power to heal that had gone out of me. I like to think of that lady's hope like a sponge. It drew what Jesus had to offer out of him. She had so much hope in him that 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 sponge drew that healing power out of Jesus and deposited that in her. So then in, in verse 47, it goes on here. And when the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, so she's like, well, I'm busted. Everybody's seen me here. She came up trembling and fell before him. See, the trembling and falling before him, that's probably who society saw her as, as someone, you know, the outcast, someone that should not be on the inside of Jewish culture. And now she's done this courageous, bold thing that hope has driven her to, and now everybody puts her front and center. And so now she's terrified. She's trembling. And she declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him, and how she had been immediately healed. And so then the story goes on in the next one. And he said to her daughter, Your faith, your personal trust and confidence in me has made you well. Go in peace, untroubled, undisturbed, and well-being. See what hope did there? What, what, what hope did to drive a person through a crowd to find Jesus, to touch him? Another story that I have for you, it's, it's about a man that had enough hope to break through a roof. See, here we find another place in Jesus' ministry where Jesus is teaching, and there's a bunch of people that are showing up to hear Jesus teach. And they're in a house, and the house is so full that people are even outside. But there's this man, and he's crippled, and he's got friends, and these friends, they want the best for him. They want something better for him. And they hear that Jesus is a miracle worker and that he can heal people. And and so they put their hope in this, that if we can just get our friend close to Jesus, then maybe this guy can walk away healed. It's the same thing. Let me bring the broken that I am to you. And then trust that you are going to heal it and make it better and give it back to me to go out and tell others about it. And so these guys couldn't get to Jesus, but they had hope. Guess what would drive somebody to dig a roof out? Hope. See, it's not as simple as knocking on the door, ringing someone's gate. They went up on top of a house and they dug a hole in the roof and they lowered the man through it. And so they they came and I'm going to jump through this for the sake of time, but they couldn't get inside the house. So then they removed the roof above Jesus. And when they had dug out the opening, they let down the mat on which the paralyzed man was lying. Karina, you can go to the next verse here. And when Jesus saw their active faith springing from confidence in him, she said to the paralyzed, or he, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. It is hope. What would cause people to dig out somebody's roof and lower a man on a cot? It's hope. Okay, the last story that I have for you is about uh, a guy named Bartimus. And he had hope enough for a loud call from the blind. And Bartimaeus was a guy that, that, was, that was blind, and he sat outside the city gates. And oftentimes Bartimaeus would, would, would just kind of sit there and beg for money, and that was his whole existence. But Barnabas gets word, he hears with his ears, because he can't see with his eyes, that there's this guy named Jesus coming. 
Now, it would be really it would be my nature to think I'm an outcast. I'm somebody that's not worthy. People believe that, that if you had something wrong with you, it's because you had sin in your life. It's like you need to be quiet. Sit outside the city wall. Sit outside the city gate. Don't open your mouth. Just be thankful for the coins that you get. But not old Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was coming. He started screaming for Jesus. He started screaming and screaming and screaming. So let's look at what happens here with Bartimaeus. Go on to the next, to the next verse, Karina. We'll skip ahead here for time. So when Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout and say, Jesus, son of David, Messiah, have mercy on me. And the men sternly rebuked him, telling him to keep still and be quiet. But he kept on shouting all the more, Son of David, Messiah, have mercy on me. See, that is hope. That's hope. I'm not going to give up. I'm just going to continue to hope. You tell me to be quiet, I'm going to shout even louder. The reason that I, I grab a cloak, the reason I dig through a roof, the reason that I shout for Jesus is because I have hope in him. It's hope. That's what makes Jesus so irresistible. Because he offers this hope that we so desperately need. Now, the second point that, that I think helps Jesus to be irresistible is his credibility. So Jesus was entire, extremely uh, credible. So his, his credibility then goes in, in two ways. So we would call secular credibility, and then we would call like uh, Christian credibility. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because there's people that devote their whole lives to arguing this thing. It's called apologetics. And if that's you, that's great. But if we're here for Sunday morning, I'm just going to kind of give you some highlights here. So let's look at the science behind Jesus, the science in the Bible. And, and here's this great statement that I found. Science and faith are not at war. We like to put them at war of each other. Well, if you believe in Jesus, you don't believe in science. If you believe in science, you don't believe in Jesus. But when scientific evidence and biblical teaching are correctly interpreted, they can, do, they can and do support each other. I would say to anyone who doubts that, investigate the evidence of yourself. And then l l wrap your head around this. This amazing kind of next quote here is, is this. There's a lot of numbers in this, so we'll try and keep it together. No book in history has dared to predict the future to the degree that the Bible has. And the Bible is... is uh, on its own plane there. Focusing on the prophecies just concerning the, son of the, the coming of Christ. For those of you that don't know this, there was a bunch of things written in the Old Testament that talked about what were going to happen when Jesus the Messiah was going to come in, in what we would call the New Testament. And those are called prophecies. And so focusing just on those prophecies and looking at just the ones around Christ coming, there were 300 direct prophecies that were all, all there and then ended up being completely true. So Jesus did all 300 sequentially and in order. So to give you some context for that, there's a guy, Dr. Charles Rye, and he says that he points out the, that by the law of chance, it would require 200 billion earths, each populated with 4 billion people, to come up with one person who could achieve 100 accurate prophecies. And then he goes on to say, without any errors in sequence, but in Christ coming along, there were not just 100, but over 300 prophecies that were fulfilled. See, see how crazy that is? Christ is not a, an accident. It did not accidentally happen. When you look at the law of chance, the idea that Jesus would sequentially fulfill 300 prophecies and not miss a single one is just amazing. That makes the scientific community pause and say, hey, whoa, wait a minute. we got to look at this. And then if you look at his credibility in the Bible, I just picked out three examples for us as I was thinking about it. There's a ton of them. Jesus' is credibility in the Bible. One of his first miracles, he turns water into wine at a wedding. One of the first stories you read about Jesus is that as a little boy, he's teaching in the temple, and the men, the Pharisees, the ones that devoted their whole life to studying the scriptures, they're amazed at what this boy is teaching. And then Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. If that's not a source of credibility, then I, I don't know what is, other than his own resurrection. And in fact, this was so incredible and so credible that this is what kind of was the last step that got the, the Jewish leaders in the Sanhedrin together to say, we got to get rid of this Jesus guy. Because he just brought somebody alive from the dead. He's going to undo our culture completely. 
See, Jesus, he guaranteed hope, and he was credible all the way. Now, the last thing that, that I'll say about Jesus and what makes him irresistible is access. See, Jesus gave access to all. See, the, the fun thing about Jesus is that no one did not have access to him. So Jesus, he was irresistible because he gave access to everyone. In fact, sinners, they loved being around Jesus, and then he loved being around you know, people that were sinners. See, I, I think that as a church, we should be that way. That we should be an irresistible church portraying an irresistible Jesus because there's people out there that don't know Jesus. And when Jesus walked around, Jesus was after the people that didn't know him, and it was those people that always wanted to hang out with him. See, Jesus was invited over to people's to, to dinner with tax collectors and dinner with people that Jewish people wouldn't even touch with a, with a, with a huge stick. And they, they pursued Jesus, and Jesus pursued them. See, Jesus gave access to everyone. See, we could look at the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. And Nicodemus was, was actually in a, in a tree. And Nicodemus, as a Pharisee and as a member of the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus was the last person that should be pursuing Jesus because these are the guys that ultimately put Jesus on the cross. But Nicodemus has climbed a tree so that he can hear Jesus speak. And Jesus goes up to him and they actually end up having dinner together. And then Nicodemus is referenced three more times in the book of John. See, Jesus gave access to somebody that was going to be a part of the people that would nail him to the cross. Another one is, is the Samaritan woman that sits at the well. And I've got the scripture for this, but we just don't have time to go through it. See, the, the Jewish people and the Samaritan people, they did not mix. So when, when Jesus or, or a good Jewish person was traveling, they would travel hundreds of kilometers out of the way so that they didn't have to go through and, and encounter any Samaritan people. And here Jesus is. He walks right through the middle of their land, and he finds a woman at a well and he sits down and he has a conversation with her and he offers her the truth basically the truth of his living word his living water you know she's trying to get water out of a well and Jesus gives her the water that's going to save her soul see Jesus took a Samaritan woman which culture would say you can't even walk in their same town and give her access to his truth completely and then the, the third example that I have for for Jesus and access would be the, the lady that was about to be stoned. So there was a lady that had been committed, uh, she'd committed adultery and she'd been brought before the, the Jewish Sanhedrin and Jesus is there and these guys are about to stone her, which means they're going to either one of two things, dig a pit and put her in it and just leave her head up and then throw rocks at her head or put her whole body down into a lower pit and throw rocks at her until she's dead. That's what's going to happen to her. And so here she is. She is in her 13th hour. Life is done. Life is over. She's been caught. She's been busted. She's brought before on trial. And now the only thing that's left for her is for that just that last decision to be made. And she is a dead person. And in her final seconds of life, before judgment, Jesus steps in. And he challenges the Pharisees. And he says, hey, are any of you guys perfect? Because you're not any better than she is. So a person condemned to death, condemned and justified by the law, was given full access to Jesus' grace, his forgiveness. And this woman walks away free. This woman walks away healed. This woman walks away with no shame. She's been completely made clean in the eyes of Jesus. See, Jesus takes anyone whether you're condemned to be stoned whether you're a pharisee whether you're of a different nation or nationality or whatever it is jesus takes it and he gives you complete access to it access to him see so the question that i would ask then is as we wrap up here is why did jesus want to be irresistible jesus came so that we could all have access to him why did jesus want to be irresistible why did he want to give us the hope? Why did he want to give us, uh, make sure that he was a credible source? Why did he want to give everybody access? Why did Jesus want to be irresistible? Well, it comes back to kind of the, the truth 
that we've been talking about through this whole series is because you are irresistible to God. See, Jesus and the hope that he brings and everything that he did, he did for you because you are irresistible to God. You, it was unavoidable. God could not avoid pursuing your heart, you. And so you all this morning get to make a choice and recognize something. There is a God who's over everything and everything. He's all the Alpha, the Omega. There is a God. And he sent a son to die for you so that your sins could be forgiven. He gave you hope. He loved you. He made a pathway for you. And you get to make the decision this morning. Do I want to accept that for my life? Do I I want to accept the idea of the truth that I could be irresistible to God? Now, I want to challenge you. You probably will not feel like you're irresistible to God because of all the things that could be happening in your life. But let me just challenge you. Take your feelings and set those aside. Look at the truth. Look at the hope that Jesus brought. Look at the facts of these people in the Bible that did anything they could to get in touch with him. We have an amazing Heavenly Father who loves us, who would do anything in the world for us. And so I'm going to pray for us, and our, our band's going to come out and lead us in a worship song, and we're going to have some prayer partners come down front if you would like prayer for anything. But my heart really breaks for you guys and for anyone else that hears this online. I hope, I hope to God that you know how much Jesus loves you. Because I know what it's like to not feel that love. And when you don't feel that love, it's really easy to assume that Jesus doesn't love you. But he does. And I I can't convince you of that. I could just sort of present a case for you this morning like we've done. But my hope and prayer is that something sinks and settles in your mind this morning and it causes you just to take a double take and think, okay, Jesus, he does love me.